this is the presentation of the results for 2017 for HIV AIDS. Uh, next slide. Myself. Okay, right. Uh, what I thought I would do is really look back on the last SP and talk about what commitments we made uh, in terms of impact results, outcome, and also how we intended to work in terms of uh, our focus at the output level. So what I want to say, first of all, is that we have two impact results that we committed to. And for us, that really translates to ending AIDS in children. So one of the uh, commitments, if I can talk to that, was uh, to prevent new infections among children, 0 to 15, uh, to about 93,000. Now, you might ask why that figure uh, I just want to say that uh, from the evidence that we have, we know that we can prevent mother-to-child transmission. We have about, have about 1.4 million women, pregnant women globally, living with HIV. And we know that if we give them drugs, antiretroviral drugs, we can reduce the risk of that mother passing the infection to our baby by less than 5%. So if you can imagine that we have about 1.4 million and we, what we want to do is to draw down infections down to less than 5%. That's the elimination agenda for mother to child. So it doesn't get to zero, but it gets closer to zero. But what we committed was we wanted to get these infections down to 93,000. And I'll come back to that result. Um, and then for children that, despite our efforts to reduce infection in children, are still getting infected, we have about 2.1 million children living with HIV under the age of 15. And our commitment was that we wanted to give them medication, 50% of them, uh, to reduce HIV-related mortality. And we know from current studies that we can reduce that mortality by over 70%. So that is the ending AIDS uh, story, reducing new infections, but also treating children so that they don't die of HIV. So that was uh, the impact result that was driving our last SP. Now, within that, one would ask, what was UNICEF trying to contribute uh, in terms of country support and uh, feeding into those impact results? And I just want to say that we had committed that as we think about coverage of antiretroviral drugs to pregnant women, but also to children, we had committed that we should at least, in nine countries, aim to reach about 80% of these populations with antiretroviral treatment. Um, so the horizon is bigger than that, but for, for our work, we're focusing on that. And then the second, which doesn't come up as an impact result, we were also very aware that as we do this, we need to close down the infections in children, in, I'm sorry, in adolescents. And so part of our commitment at outcome level was to make sure that adolescent girls and young women and adolescent boys have access to preventive interventions to stop them from acquiring infection during adolescence. And our indicator for that was condom use. Next slide. Um, so in terms of how we're working, so. UNICEF work over the last SP and last year was really to make sure that we are working with countries to make sure that uh, the children and caregivers are supported for healthy behaviors. And some of the things that we committed to was engaging countries on behavioral change and communication strategies, making sure that we are working with adolescents and children around knowledge of HIV, and also making sure that part of what we do has to build uh, the evidence uh, base, but also to implement evidence-based uh, preventive interventions. Um, capacity within the health system remains limited, but with this particular intervention, we've always been very clear that it's about taking services to people. So for pregnant women, making sure that we integrate HIV testing and also antiretroviral um, uh, um, services within ANC, but also broadening that to make sure that child services can also respond to HIV uh, infection in children, so testing children. Uh, to do that effectively, one of the things that we, we've always focused on is simplica simplification 
of approaches. So you find in the report that we talk a lot about option B+, plus, which is the one pill, one CD to every woman to stop that infection from occurring. But you also see a lot of focus on making sure that providers are able to test people from where they are. So we talk about provider-initiated testing, but we also talk about task shifting. It's been an, a, a daunting task working across countries to make sure that they understand that for us to deliver these services, we need to take them to the lowest unit of care. And so that means that it's not going to be delivered by doctors. It has to be delivered by whoever is there. But our role as UNICEF to develop those capacities for people to be able to effectively do that. We've also been delivering these services in very difficult circumstances around in humanitarian uh, crisis. And you'll find that one of our key achievements of how many is how many children and mothers we've been able to reach to uh, in uh, humanitarian conditions. Um, in terms of uh, the work on uh, prevention, uh, we did commit to uh, making sure that we have age, dis age and sex disaggregated data, but also making sure that uh, the HIV strategies within countries um, were actually gender sensitive. So moving on then, um, I just want to go over a few results. Um, these are amazing slides. I like them a lot because they tell the story going back to 2000 of what we've been able to achieve to deliver antiretroviral medications to pregnant women. And in the green line on the right, um, what you see there is the reduction that we've been able to achieve in new infections in children going back to 2000. What um, you find in our report is that we say we are saying that going back to 2000, there's been a, about 2 million child infections averted. That translates to a 60% reduction in new infections um, globally in children. But if you look at our benchmark a year, which is 2012, we were um, uh, from the 1.4 million pregnant women um, that um, are likely to pass on infection to their babies. Our benchmark there in terms of new infections in babies for 2012, uh, which is the benchmark for this current SP, was 230,000. And as I said before, our goal was to get to 93,000. Uh, I'll come back to where we are in a minute. And then when you look at, and that has happened because over 70% of women are accessing antiretroviral medication through the prenatal units or the antenatal care units within countries. On, on the other side is the slide that talks to treatment in children. Now, although the progress in children, you can see, has not been as good as what we've had for adults and also for <coughs> pregnant women, uh, we have about 43% compared to 76% in pregnant, pregnant women of children accessing antiretroviral drugs. But you can see the trajectory has also been on the increase. And what we had said, knowing that it will be a little bit more difficult for us to reach the levels we're reaching in pregnant women in children. And I'll come back to that, um, why it's more difficult in children. We had set the bar for the SP for 50%, and where we are is 43% in terms of our progress. Next slide. Oh, I keep forgetting that I have to do this. <laughs> All right, so when you look at this then, um, uh, we, when we look at reduction in new infections, um, Going back to 2010, uh, our reduction estimate is about 47% reduction. Um, I, I, I know we're going back to 2010 in the report because that's how um, DRP actually does the analysis. But there were 300,000 new infections in babies out of the mothers that I mentioned uh, in 2010. And we've drawn it down to about 160,000 in 2016. Remember that our goalpost for 2017 is 93,000 for this particular population. But what I want to say is that this, as I've said, over 70% of women globally are accessing these drugs. Um, and we had committed in the SP that we we'll reach, we'll, as I said before, that we want to make sure that at least in nine countries, priority countries, uh, we, we, we achieve at least 80% coverage across the country for these interventions. And you can see there that we, in 11 of the 22 priority countries, we're able to achieve this. So it's a great achievement. But it doesn't get us to uh, where we want it to be because there's so much variability between countries like Nigeria, for example, that makes up one third of infections in children. 
the coverage in Nigeria is less than 30%. So you can see uh, that although we're doing well in some countries, uh, we're not doing that great in some of the more difficult countries like Nigeria and DRC. Um, for children, in terms of coverage of treatment, uh, less than 50% of children uh, were accessing this intervention in 2016, uh, which is a, a 43% our estimate, uh, which falls short of our 2017 target of 50%. But again, we had also committed that we want to do at least achieve 80% coverage in at least nine countries within this current SP 2017. And you see there that we've only got three. So it's much more difficult to actually deliver this intervention in children. And the starting point is how are we uh, testing children for HIV? As we sit today, I will tell you that the technology and the expertise that you need to test a, uh, a, for HIV in children remains very centralized in big laboratories. So the challenge of actually transporting samples to the laboratory and results back to children means by that even when children do come to the health facilities, we are having enormous challenges in getting samples to the lab. UNICEF did pioneer a few years ago the use of filter paper and dry blood spots on filter paper to transport samples to the lab. We also have tested out use of SMS to actually deliver results back to the facility. The logistical challenges still remain, but what I want to mention, as, uh, and I'll mention it later, is that we are moving into innovative technologies that can be uh, 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 situated at the point of service to actually overcome this challenge. But because of this challenge, one, the testing rates of children remain low. Two, even when children are tested, we're losing over 50% to actually initiation of treatment. So results don't come back, results get lost, mothers get frustrated because results are not coming back on time. So even when we test children, we're losing them. And then retention in care remains a challenge for a lot of these children. So the second point that I want to make is around just the formulations for children. I talked about one pill once a day for the mother. We don't have that luxury in children. It's, it, child, child treatments continue to be complicated and with supply division, we're working to see how we can work with pharma to continue to simplify uh, treatment for children. But because of that, uh, it means extremely challenging for mothers to continue to come because the child is growing and the treatment dosages are changing. And some of these uh, treatments are in syrups and they are heavy and mothers have to work long, long distances. So this is an area of focus that we need to continue to challenge in terms of how we work with private sector and pharma to simplify dosing uh, for children. Uh, moving on to the, to the second decade of life, which is adolescent girls and boys, um, the statistic I have on the slide is around treatment. And you see there that they're doing worse than uh, the children. So for the, for the adolescents 10 to 19, only 36% of them were accessing uh, ART in 2016, which is much lower than our goal post of 50% for children. And the challenges in adolescence is, is um, are multiple. One, we don't have good services still for them to access and feel comfortable to come to. Uh, second, testing remains a challenge of this population because of prohibitive laws and policies. Uh, age of consent issues, UNICEF is working with that with multiple partners to look at what we can do to, um, to reduce the age of consent for services, uh, especially for HIV testing in this population. And third, even when they are tested, actually making sure that they access treatment and they are maintained on treatment continues to be a challenge. And you see there that we had set our, our goal to actually do this, uh, to make sure that at least in 10 countries, 80% of adolescents have access to treatment and we only achieve two. So it remains a challenge and it's something that we recognize and we've taken forward into the next SP. And finally, on prevention, um, this is one area that you see in our results that we have not done very well. And part of this is, I think, is just programming approach and programming strategy. 14% reduction in new infections since 2010. 
compared to what I've talked about in, in the younger population. So next slide looks at what that looks like. So over time, you can see in the red line that those are new infections in adolescents. Uh, we're sitting at 260,000 new infections in 2016 uh, in adolescents compared to 160,000 in the, in the younger children. And that's just a 14% reduction going back to 2010. Um, so this is a major concern that everybody recognizes. I just want to say that it's not peculiar to this population. Our prevention agenda globally for adults and, and adolescents has been very slow. Hence, in 2016, uh, UNA has actually put out what we call the GAP report, which actually talked about alarmed the world around the fact that new infections are not going down and we're not going to curb the epidemic if we don't actually curb new infections. And what has happened since that time, and UNICEF is part of what is now being called the Global Coalition for Prevention, uh, as something that we have to catalyze, uh, given um, the strain on the system that we now see with so many people accessing treatment, but also the resources that go with that uh, in terms of uh, uh, treatment uh, need in, in country. And the fact that now the Global Fund uh, is so stretched that they're finding uh, it's very hard for the Global Fund to put money on prevention when every country that they support has such a huge uh, treatment burden. But moving on on children, in terms of UNICEF's leadership, we are leading the effort uh, on adolescent girls and young women uh, prevention together with PEPFAR. And the idea there is to look at the key determinants of infection for adolescent girls and young women. And we do know that they're highly vulnerable compared to their peers. By the age of 15, we start to see a separation in terms of how many adolescent girls are being infected. And many of these uh, adolescents are infected by much older men. And we now know that that cycle of infection is much older men uh, infecting adolescent girls, adolescent girls getting married to their peers when they're ready to get married, and then infecting their peers and infecting their babies. So what you see in a lot of the documentation from UNICEF is this life cycle <clears throat> approach that addresses infection risk from that cycle uh, that we're seeing in adolescents, especially in Africa. So, so the Stay Free initiative that is led by UNICEF and PEPFAR is exactly to look at what are the multiple deprivations and vulnerabilities that these girls are going through uh, that we need to address uh, from a multi-sectoral uh, response. The second is that UNICEF launched All In um, under the leadership of Tony Lake in 20, 2015. And All In is about adolescence generally in terms of prevention and treatment. And what is it we need to do to galvanize better services for this population? A lot of what is hidden behind uh, the lack of progress in adolescence is just because services are not being delivered in a way that is attractive to them. And we need to actually look at differenti differentiated care models for this particular population. And we continue to look at that. And one of the things that's been so powerful with All In is how we've been able to galvanize the partnership around this in terms of looking into the data country by country to find out what's going on. And based on that, leveraging other partner engagement around what needs to be done differently. So look, going into the next SP, this is an area of work that we want to focus on. So in terms of key contributions, and I'll go through this very quickly, uh, what I wanted to highlight uh, when we look at the first decade, which is uh, children 0 to 10, 0 to 15, uh, in terms of UNICEF key contributions, I've just highlighted five here, but you'll find that in the report we have other things. But um, in terms of moving to the last mile of the elimination agenda for mother-to-child transmission of HIV, uh, UNICEF has been working to see how we can facilitate uh, dialogue within countries by setting up programs that actually link uh, health facilities with communities to do two things. One is to mobilize women to come to prenatal care so that they can be tested and put on drug. So the women that are left out in the response, how do we work with communities to make sure that we bring them in, including uh, working with social protection systems to make sure that we bring them in. And then second, once they are in the system, how do we 
how do we make sure that we work at the community level so that women are supported to continue care and to adhere to their medication. So with the support from Sweden, we're able to do this in four countries. This project is now completed and has been, the results have been disseminated in various fora, including with women's, we, we, the community of women living with HIV to see how these um, interventions can actually be adopted more widely, but also sustained in the four countries that we're working. The second, I talked about the difficulty of uh, diagnosis in children and what UNICEF now is doing in 10 countries with support from UNITAID and working with Clinton Health Access Initiative, we're actually introducing and integrating emerging technologies that have been proven to be effective point of care technologies that can be placed at the lowest unit of care so that children can actually access uh, testing. And the results from this is amazing and you'll find it in the report that actually the turnaround time to results has been reduced down to zero because these tests can do same day testing to results. And secondly, more children are being initiated on treatment as a, as a result of this. And if my, my memory is correct, it's about 50% more children in the countries where we're doing this and in the sites where we're doing this, more children are actually accessing treatment. And one surprising thing that we found is that by mothers being empowered with the result on the same day, child being on drug on the same day, the retention in care is also show, showing to be uh, very positive. In addition to the point of care technology, we also know that, especially in those countries where uh, the prevention of mother to child transmission services are not happening, where we don't know the HIV status of women, is that a lot of children, uh, we don't know who they are and where they are. So one innovation that we're very proud of to report in the report is the work we've done in DRC and Zimbabwe, where we're actually targeting adults that are accessing treatment because we have a lot more adults that are accessing treatment and linking children to to testing through those people so index testing index case finding to test children using uh, multiple approaches including home-based testing of children and we're finding that this is a very useful modality that has to be adopted and as we speak uh, i think in two weeks time we're gonna have um, a regional meeting uh, in Western Central Africa that is bringing countries together this, because they are the farthest behind, you find in our report, around this family-centered approach to testing more children. Uh, we're also integrating HIV testing in our flagship uh, services like immunization, malnutrition, um, community management of diarrhea and pneumonia. And this has been piloted in a number of countries. And we're finding that by targeting both well and sick children, we're finding more children that are infected with HIV. And finally, we continue to be very concerned about Western Central Africa. The, bed, the burden in Western Central Africa is second to Eastern Southern Africa, and yet they're very much behind. And UNICEF has elevated the discourse around children in that region. And we put out a report in December that has really been uh, has been a game changer in terms of donor engagement around West Africa, and the, con uh, the conversation continues. So in terms of key contributions for our uh, second decade, I talked about OLN, which was really about galvanizing support to focus on this particular population. And the work on OLN has been very much data and trying to use that data to change the discourse around adolescent treatment and care. And as a result of that, um, we are now uh, the lead with PEPFA to focus on adolescent girls and young women because of the data we've been able to generate and are shifting some of the conversation in countries in terms of how we program. I give two examples here. One is the She Conquers campaign in South Africa that is really about mobilizing girls around some of the behaviors, but also mobilizing communities around some of the behaviors around gender-based violence, sexual violence, and the fact that these girls are continue to uh, engage in transactional sex with much older men, and so mobilizing communities around that. And then secondly, as part of this whole focus on adolescent girls and young women, UNICEF now is um, one of the lead agencies supporting the Global Fund 
for their catalytic grant for targeting adolescent girls and young women to provide TA to the countries that are beneficiary of these grants. Um, then uh, what I also want to say within the Global Prevention Coalition, UNICEF and PEPFAR have been recognized as the key uh, partners to support countries with technical assistance to change the conversation on how to program uh, for prevention, especially for adolescent girls and young women. Uh, reaching out to adolescents through peers is something that we're finding to be very useful in a, a lot of our programs, and I've highlighted some of the ways in which we are reaching out to adolescents. Teen clubs uh, in Cameroon, Swaziland, and Tanzania. You report as a mechanism for uh, getting uh, adolescents talking to each other, but also mobilizing them to access services. Youth Away in Brazil, which is a community program uh, targeting young people um, through mobile vans, to get them tested, and then Lollipop is also a social networking of adolescents living with HIV in Indonesia for them to access and be retained in treatment. So lots of things happening in the second decade, but I must say this is an area of concern for us going into the next SP that we haven't achieved as much as we achieved for the first decade. And the, the challenges are plenty, but we do have good um, evidence and good program experiences to feel confident that we could we can't put a dent on this particular like, epidemic as it pertains to this population um, so in terms of programming shifts then um, what I want to highlight is none of this uh, will work if we UNICEF doesn't focus on better data and when I talk about data it also has to be not just the national aggregates, but data which is more localized for us to target better, not just our work, but our investments, um, including how we leverage our, our partners to invest more in those areas where we think um, the, the focus needs to be. So linked to that then is moving from more generalistic approaches to more targeted approaches, but also differentiated to population. When I talk about adolescents not accessing services, I think it's exactly that, that we need differentiated service delivery models that make that talk, make sense for, for adolescents. Integration is a key focus as well. Um, the HIV funding from where I sit is not where it used to be in 2008, for example. And it's becoming increasingly difficult to have siloed programs for HIV. So one of the things that we want to move forward with in the next SV is to, sh to demonstrate how to effectively integrate. It's not integration for the, uh, for the purpose of integration, but it's integration for results uh, and synergy and impact, and probably within that efficiencies and effectiveness of programs. Um, now, one of the things that um, I am very passionate about um, within this current SP, because there's so many unknowns, especially when we talk about differentiated care, when we talk about integration, one of the things that I think we all need to rally behind is program learning. What are we learning from programs and how are we documenting that learning? How are we generating evidence from, from those programs and who are we sharing it with? How do, we use that, how do we use that program learning to sharpen and leverage better responses at the country level and investments at the country level? So within the, the new SP, we do have a focus area in the HIV program around program learning. Now, all this um, has to also focus on uh, how we advocate. And I just want to say that all the things that I've talked about are helping inform how we leverage government ownership and commitment to sustain uh, and improve current efforts. So finally, I, I think the next thing would be, so what is UNICEF's um, uh, comparative advantage? I've talked about the data. We, I think we, we're very strong on data. We put out data every year, and within this particular program, we're actually able to collect information down from the country and put out annual report together with WHO and UNAIDS on what's happening on the response, and we'll continue to do that. UNICEF is well known for its multi-sectoral program. We work in the different sectors. The challenge for HIV is how we leverage the resources that are coming through the other sectors for results for children. And I think that's one comparative advantage that everybody recognizes, including our donors, and we'll continue to work on effective integration and leveraging for results. Um, 
we work well, civil society and communities, and I've mentioned some of the work we've been doing. Ending AIDS will not happen within that, with this, within, without this focus. The challenge uh, globally is that investments to civil society for HIV alone is actually going down. So again, how do we work with civil society that we've been working with to leverage better results for children, but while keeping a focus on HIV? Um, the human resource capacity of UNICEF from headquarters to country level continues to be strong. We've just done that analysis. And that is important if we're going to leverage partnerships at the country level and leverage better results. And I, I would urge that we at least maintain a core capacity in UNICEF for HIV. Otherwise, no staff means no program. That's the new mantra. Yeah. <laughs> no staff, no program. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and I think it talks to why I need flexible money. Um, we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, lessons learned. I have a few there. Um, increasingly, it's about coordination and collaboration. And you can see that UNICEF is still seen as a leader on a lot of these areas. And so we need to maintain that and make sure that we're able to convene and talk about what we are learning in a way that makes sense and sharpens our response to get to the end of AIDS in children. Um, differentiated service delivery approaches, innovation, I think is important. And I've talked to some of that, um, especially as we talk about technologies and other platforms to get better results. Uh, data, I've talked about that, and I think it's not just about data, but it's also quality of data and what level we're collecting this data to sharpen, to get to that last mile of our response. Decentralization with accountability, we've seen for PMTCD, or prevention of mother-to-child transmission, that decentralizing services to where women are is going to be important. But we also have to do that knowing that we need to work with communities and we need to make sure that we're able to facilitate that community facility linkages for our population to access services, support it, and be retained in care, including uh, drug adherence. Uh, the value of social protection schemes, I couldn't emphasize more. A lot of the bottlenecks that we see in terms of access and retention has to do with the um, situation and the environment that um, these uh, populations reside in, including poverty. And we've seen from the work that we're doing with funding um, uh, from um, funding to, 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 to uh, East and Southern Africa, dedicated funding to this, that we're seeing better results in that region compared to Western Central Africa, where they don't have good social protection uh, mechanisms in their, uh, in their environments. Um, creating supportive and care-seeking environment with policies. Um, I think here I talked about HIV testing in adolescents remaining challenges just because of the legal frameworks that we have. Um, and eight is about that and uh, the need to engage and empower clients to advocate. And for us in UNICEF, how we work with adolescents and children to have a voice um, within this very crowded environment um, of civil society is very, very uh, critical. So looking forward to the next SP, I have just have a few things. From what I've said, it's really about the unfinished agenda for eliminating mother-to-child transmission. It's about prevention in adolescence. It's about closing the treatment gap, both for children and for adolescents. And I think from what I've presented, we actually know where we need to focus. We just need to have dedicated uh, programs for us to move the needle on what we need to do. Uh, so in terms of the shifts in the strategy for 2018 and 2021, we very much focused on a differentiated response to get better results and to get to that last mile. We focused on integration for joint results uh, with clearly defined accountability by the different sectors intensified partner leveraging, and you'll see what we've done with All In and what is happening now in terms of UNICEF's positioning and prevention, and then the strength and knowledge leadership to enhance um, program responses through a learning collaborative. So what are we learning from programs, as I've mentioned? I think that's the last slide. Oh, I have to, sorry. So just to say thank you for 
the flexible funding that we continue to have from our major donors. And I've listed uh, the key donors for us in terms of flexible money um, on this slide. And just for me, I think this slide is very humbling. Um, we do what we do with very little resources coming to HIV AIDS. And as I said, we are focusing on integrating the program, but without dedicated staff, this is not going to be possible. And again, our top donors, and thank you.